poem is somewhat like love or like time if you please it's fulfilled in itself a poem demands nothing it does not aspire for anything it is its own trial and realization it is its own content and expanse its own relevance and justification the poet himself self created creates its meaning and also its obscurity वर्तमान मोर अपेक्षा मान अतीत उद्दिष्ट थिला, मोर समस्त स्मृति केवल भविष्य जहा कि स्मृतिहीन अपेक्षाहीन से सब मोर वर्तमान प्रेजेंट ऑल माय वेटिंग वाज फॉर द पास्ट ऑल माय मेमोरीज वर ऑफ द फ्यूचर ऑल दैट इज विदाउट मेमोरी विदाउट वेटिंग इज माय प्रेजेंट This quiet, searching and wandering look carries within it a wealth of imagination which creates a new dimension to his observation of life. His identity may not be easily realized, yet he lets you read his thoughts and feelings through his writings. Whether it is poetry, fiction or drama or criticism, He lets it out sensitively and lucidly with emotional clarity and honesty of expression. His poetry is free from cerebration and intellection. In fact, he is a versatile writer with indomitable courage who has dominated the Oriya literary scene for the last 3 decades. Nature has its own mood. Sometimes it rains to one's delight, at other times it adds to human predicament. In 1866, Urissa went through severe famine. About one third of the population perished during that period. This famine was a man-made disaster. The administration had wrongly believed that there was enough food grain available. and had refused to stop export of grains or bring grains on government account the result was that abject hunger held the people in its fatal grip This is the book that talks about that hunger and projects the vivid moments of that period. With a superb communicative skill, the writer has presented the facts with such authentic description that it makes the reader himself feel the pangs of hunger. The second half of the 19th century had been a very poignant and crucial period in the history of Orissa. While famine took a heavy toll of human life, the affairs of the state also fared no better JP does want to discuss which books oh th that would be nice uh, no no not this evening maybe tomorrow because i'm going out now tomorrow is fine he believes that to understand a writer's work it is not necessary to know about his life Once Tagore had mentioned 
that one does not find the poet in his life story. He had made this comment while reviewing a biography of Tennyson and had concluded by saying that what the poet had gifted to the people was his poetry, not his life. J.P. Das says that his life could be written on the head of a pin. J.P. Das was born in an Orissa village in 1936. He grew up and did his study in school and college in the small town of Katak. He went to Allahabad for his post-graduation. After his master's there, he served as a lecturer in the Allahabad University for a year. He then joined the Indian Administrative Service and did various odd jobs in Orissa and Delhi. After 20 years of service, he took two years off to research a book on Orissan painting. During this research period, he started reflecting on his life and felt a vacuum. Then he decided to quit. He left the IAS when he was 47 and has always felt that he could have done it earlier. Well, I have been writing for uh, more than 50 years now. I published my first poem, I think, when I was in school. Since then, I have written poetry and then I switched over to writing plays. I've done short stories and uh, I've done a historical novel. In between, I did some research on art history and published books on that also. But uh, now that I'm uh, writing less and less, I think uh, I'm going to write about only things that I feel very strongly about. According to him, he stopped writing when he joined service because its responsibilities overwhelmed him. But he resumed writing after a gap of nearly 15 years. His first collection of poems, Pratham Purush, came out in 1971. It was published not by a regular publisher, but a friend who never published a second book. <laughs> yes, Pratham Purusha was my first publication and perhaps the last one. I knew JP and his wife Mitra very well, who used to spend many evenings here reading his poems. Then in 1971, I suggested why not we publish it as the first collection of your poems. He was excited, naturally. Then we thought who should design the cover and we thought Sotheed Rai would be the person who should design the cover. Yes, the eminent filmmaker Sotheed Rai. So we approached him through a personal friend of ours and he, he said, I would like to have the translation of all the poems into English and Bengali. And after I go through that, only then I would think of doing the cover design. So we had to do it. And then he went through it and then he said, uh, all right, I will do the sketch first and then tell me who will be the printer. I said, anyone you would like. He said it should be the Radiant Press in Calcutta and Radiant Press Calcutta only. J.P. Das feels that his three-year stay in Kalahandi as collector is the most rewarding of his service career. Today, people are familiar with the name Kalahandi just like other places such as Bafra, Somalia. But when he went there about 40 years back, it was back of the beyond, even for the Uriyas. It was in 1965-66 that Kalahandi first came to national notice when famine hit the district. As the communication to this place was poor, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, then Prime Minister, had visited Kalahandi in a helicopter. And this is alluded to in J.P. Das's poem on Kalahandi. Kalahandi, put away the roadmaps now. To go there, you do not need helicopters anymore. Wherever there is hunger, there Kalahandi is. The god of rain turned away his face. There was not one green leaf left on the trees to eat. The whole village, a graveyard. The ground cracked, river sand dried up, all the plants failed, the poverty line receded further. Wherever you look, there is Kalahandi, in the sunken eyes of living skeletons, in rags which do not cover the frail bodies, 
in the utensils pawned off for food, in the crumbling huts with unthatched roofs, in the exclusive prosperity of having owned two earthen pots. Kolahandi is everywhere, in the gathering of the famished crowds before charity kitchens, in market places where children are auctioned off, in the size of young girls sold to brothels, in the silent procession of helpless people leaving their heart and home. Come, look at Kalahandi closer, in the crocodile tears of false statements, in the exaggerated statistics of computer printouts, in the cheap sympathies doled out at conferences and in the false assurances presented by planners. Kalahandi is very close to us, in the occasional contrition of our souls, in the unexpected nagging of conscience, in the rare repentance of the inner self, in the nightmares appearing through sound sleep, in disease, in hunger, in helplessness, in the abject fear of an impending bloodshed. How could we then walk into the celebrated portals of the 21st century, leaving Kalahandi behind? Some complain about the incomprehensibility of modern poetry. They must know that the poem is like a picnic. The poet brings the words, the reader brings the sense. The reader not only construes, he also constructs. So if a reader fails to make sense of a poem, he has only himself to blame. The temple, like a meditating monk in his ritual posture, the temple sits solemnly under time's omniscient canopy. The priest is engaged in playful banter with the major icons. The listless seedling gapes from the gargoyle's shoulder. The chorus of prayers like a lonesome child who has lost its way roams about the temple yard. From the steps to the pavilion, from the courtyard to the altar, the tired echoes of the mantra caress the keepers of the ten directions and return to rest in the indifferent recesses of the iconless walls. Incense smoke finds no escape, prayers get trapped in the walls, flowers of worship fail to brighten up the time-worn temple floor. Offerings wander about from one corner to the other, looking for the forlorn soul. Prayers come back to get lost in the innermost mind. Beyond knowledge and belief, the evening lamp keeps flickering like a desolate wish. In the sanctum sanctorum, the God stays contented all by its holy self, in the harsh authenticity of its own iconography. According to J.P. Das, the poet has to go through three hells. The first is the hell of emotional experience. In this, the poet is no different from others. The second hell is the hell of creation. This is the most difficult. For him, anything that is not a poem is easy, like filling up the income tax return or doing a crossword puzzle. The third hell is the cruelest and severest of all. It is the hell of assessment, evaluation and criticism, where the critics take great pleasure in tearing poems to pieces. The sea. The sea is a portrait of deep blue emotions which reflect the core of my innermost thoughts. Its voice floats through each oyster and each conch shell echoes its resonance. Experiences transcend my passions and dissolve in the waves. I take back all my promises made to eternity. On the farthest estuaries of my desultory sorrows, time gives back to me one by one the shadowy reflections of all my experience. Right, the gods took their stands facing each other with their armies in tow on the innocent street. Intolerance became a weapon. Anger fortified the hands. Hatred prodded on the legs. Fundamentalism obliterated the simple logic of conscience. And then a reign of beastly terror, sacrament of blood, offering of slain heads, incense of burning houses, and the congregational prayer of painful shrieks. When curfew was clamped, gods went back their way to the ordained heavens 
Ambulances carried away to the hospital the wounded and the dying. Police vans took the corpses to the city morgues. Wails and siren sounds got lost in the smell of burning houses and gunpowder. No one noticed the corpse lying in the drain. He had come to the street begging for alms. No one knew his name or his religion. Now he is beyond all sacred texts and faiths. It is only his dead eyes which still keep staring, fixed and merciless at the remorseless heaven, darkened by the black smoke of a forlorn future. A poem exists in its own sovereign land, itself its lord and master. From poetry, he tried writing in other forms. He wrote the first full-length play in 1972. It was titled Before the Sunset. I wrote some one-act plays in the 1960s, uh, but I wrote my first uh, full-length play in 1972. It was done in a Bangla version in Calcutta in uh, 1973, and its Hindi translation was staged in Delhi in 1976. Ram Gopal Bajaj was the director of the play. I did uh, Jagannath Prasad Das's play Suryastak, known as Before the Sunset, originally an Odia play. I had got the script from Mr. Das from All India Radio sometime in 1974. And then it was planned from Dishantar Theatre Group of that time I was associated with. And uh, it was in 75 at IFX Theatre we did the play with Om Puri in the central role and then Sudesh Sayal, Ved Sina and I was directing it. The play deals with uh, a young person about to turn 40 having the relationship and not yet not made very big in his professional field and that was the time people were also under the impact of angry theatre and uh, absurd theatre and all told the play was entertaining, experimental and absurdist. J.P. Das has so far written 11 collections of poetry. Out of these, 8 have been published in Hindi translation and 7 in English translation. I first met J.P. in 1995 when I first came to Bhubaneswar. He was particularly helpful in organizing uh, meetings with writers, with uh, giving me suggestions as to the sort of work that I should be doing there. This evolved over the years into actually working, collaborating with him on the translation of his own works, notably uh, on the translation of a play a collection of short stories and of two collections of poetry, one Love Lines and the second In Dark Times, which is to appear next year. Uh, this uh, collaboration with him has been a very, um, a very welcome experience for me. It's, uh, his poetry is one which uh, connects both the personal to the political, the uh, voice of an individual speaking about events which are both historical and uh, present. Um, this particular tonality, individuality of his voice is one which I think touches the reader of his poetry, makes a connection to these readers. And the political and historical dimension of his poetry is one which ties his work to the real world, which uh, connects it not only to the individual but to the social. It is this interrelation between the individual and the social in his work which I think is a particular attraction. If contemporary Oriya poetry has acquired a new dimension and sophistication in terms of vision, technical integrity and innovative use of the creative medium, it was because of his contribution. An unusual blending of the sense of beauty and the sense of joy in living and loving makes his poetry pulsate with vibrance.
J.B. Da started writing fiction rather late in life. He wrote his first story titled Shabd Bhed in 1980. It was about a poet and poetry. Since then he has written a number of short stories. This book Katha Yatra contains his selected short stories. Your short story, The Problem, has a very interesting plot. How did you conceive it? Uh, this is about a person who has a problem and he goes to the ashram. And when one writes a short story, many of one's own experiences uh, get uh, woven into the short story. So far as uh, this story is concerned, I think I took the idea of an ashram of my own experience of having lived in Maharishi Maheshwagi's ashram. Uh, for a couple of weeks and uh, that perhaps uh, gave me the idea of uh, doing a story about a uh, person with a problem and uh, his going to the Guru. You've written for children also? Yes, I've also written for children. I have uh, two collections of poems for children. One is called uh, Ali Malika and the other is called Onabana. I have written some nonsense verses also that have been collected in a volume called Alukuchi Malukuchi. In Oriya, all the three words mean odds and ends. The frog keeps croaking, it gets hoarser, the elephant takes a spin in his roadster, the owl's uncle and the monkey's niece are verily the villains of the piece. The creatures learning Hindi kicked up quite a shindy from amidst all the brava, the jackal asked kya hua, joining the abysmal howl, ha ha who? said the owl. Not to be left out at that, may owl, said the cat. I've also done some translations of uh, Oriya women poets with Arlene Jaid. I have translated a collection of poems by Catherine Clement from French into English with her. And uh, my last translation was uh, Gulshar's poems from Urdu into English. Nice, uh, or I should say nicer about the translation than uh, about my own poems. <laughs> His translations that have given, just say my poems have been varnished by his translation. They have given a shine to it. He is very boyish in his poise, in his uh, attitude, in his approach, even in his poems and his writings. And he does that in spite of being a scholar really. And uh, he has done a lot of research work in Uriya, in the history of um, Uriya arts. I have seen him working in the libraries and in Odisha. But uh, with that scholarly background and to remain so young and boyish and uh, write uh, limericks, you know, it's, it's something which is a very, very uh, young boyish man can do poet with that kind of a nature. My very favorite poems are those which he published in 1978, The Season of Love. And a very, very honest friend, a very honest friend. He doesn't have any so, koi, koi vested interest, koi selfishness. Koi, he said, I mean, if you are in a crisis or in a problem, even if it is against yourself, but he will give you honest opinion. He will never lie. He will never pretend. And I think that's a very big asset of any man. He has that courage. It is with that courage only that he could uh, just just leave his entire job and bureaucratic job and said, no, no more. I just want to write. 